Welcome to Cessnock Congregational Church. Today, Sunday, the 19th of July. Later on, Neville will be bringing the Word of God to us from Matthew chapter 12. And it's a great passage. Well, let's start our time together in prayer. Please bow your heads with me. Father God, thank you that we can come together virtually to meet once again. Father, we look forward to a time when we can be together in person as well. But we thank you for your sustenance during this time. Lord, we do pray for our country, for our community and for the world, uh, that you will be sustaining all people to have patience, uh, to be turning to you under these times of duress, and that you'll be working in the governments to make wise decisions that balance the safety of the people that look to them for guidance and leadership. And God, we know that you have so much to teach us during this time, and we just pray that we would have ears to hear and hearts that are open to the lessons you have for us. Amen. I'm sure some of you can relate to the question, am I actually a Christian? This is something that uh, from time to time I've doubted. I became a Christian when I was 15, and there have been times in my life since then when I've taken a step back and reflected and gone, am I actually a Christian? I believe it in my head, but am I actually following Jesus with my heart? Um, and the, when we become a Christian, we don't get a certificate in the mail saying this is to certify, certify that Doug Hughes has become a Christian and done, you know, following Jesus 101. We don't get that. And so we have to look at the evidence in our lives. And this is something that we've been looking at in my Bible study group is uh, the evidence that you are following Jesus is that you are becoming more like Jesus each day. And the passage that Neville will be preaching to us from uh, helps us to look at one aspect of this evidence. What is this evidence that we can look at to just feel that sense of assurance? The other theme that comes through in the passage today is that of uh, religious corruption. One of Jesus' favourite pastimes was giving it to the Pharisees, who were the religious elite, the establishment of the day. And he did not hold back when he was telling them his opinion of what it really looked like to be a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus, of God. And today's passage brings those two themes together. We get to see the critique that Jesus levels at the religious establishment, but we also get to see some clues about what it might look like to be a disciple of Jesus today. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 to 37, and I'll be reading from the NIV. Whilst you're finding that passage, Matthew 12, verse 33, just a bit of context. Some people have brought a man to Jesus who is blind, mute, and demon-possessed. And what he's done is he's healed them. He's healed the man. But the Pharisees are not happy about this, and they start to accuse him of being having his power from Beelzebul, the prince of darkness. And Jesus unleashes a long uh, list of accusations against them, and verse 33 to 37 comes at the end of that. He says... Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good, bad, good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to uh, Cessna Congregational Church Online Teaching Ministry. It's uh, really good to have you along. A little disappointing that we couldn't meet uh, last Sunday because of the inclement weather, but uh, we're very thankful that we've got this uh, means of technology that we can communicate and to uh, get our sermons out. So hopefully you're, uh, you're finding them uh, helpful and, and enriching and profitable. Let me pray. Father, we just want to take time to say thank you for your goodness, for your love, for your generosity, for your patience, your kindness, your grace, your mercy, for your holiness. And Father, as we turn our attention to your word, we recognise, Lord, that our need to be instructed, our need to be corrected, rebuked, encouraged, built up in faith, built up in our trust in your son, King Jesus. 
Father, we freely confess that we are like sheep. We have the propensity to go astray and wander off and impose our own will and be negligent and foolish. And so we thank you for the good shepherd. Uh, We thank you for Jesus who has laid down his life for his sheep, who gathers us and searches for us and gathers us and brings us into his fold and into his care, into his family. Father, we would pray that as we turn our attention to your word, that each one of us would be attentive and be receptive and responsive to your word. We thank you afresh that you have not left us to our own devices. And we thank you that your word is sharper than a double-edged sword. Hear our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been estimated that from the time one gets out of bed in the morning until the time one retires, the average person engages in 30 conversations. Now, conceded, friends, some people can talk underwater, so I guess 30 conversations is uh, a little conservative, but each person's words can fill a book 50 or 60 pages long. That is the equivalent of more than 100 books a year comprising of 200 pages. Now, it's not surprising that immediately after Jesus confronted the Pharisees for their unforgiving blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, he then began to teach on the importance of the tongue. You see, the most self-damning words ever heard had just been spoken by the Pharisees who accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. Therefore, Jesus gives one of his most sobering warnings. And in the process, he exposes the truth about the nature of a man's tongue. He said, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognised by its fruit. So Jesus initiates a warning with a short parable to underscore an obvious truth. A tree and its fruit correspond. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. You see, the impress that Jesus was trying to make here on the Pharisees is you must make up your mind. You must make up your mind about me and my ministry. You, You must be clear. You cannot be ambiguous. Either I am evil and I do evil work, or I am good and do good work. I cannot be evil and do good work, and I cannot be good and do evil work. So Jesus was saying, you Pharisees, listen up. You need to listen up. If I do good works, it is by God's power. If I do evil works, it is by Satan's power. You see, friends, God empowers nothing evil, and Satan empowers nothing good. Demon possession is clearly the evil work of Satan. Therefore, exercising demonic spirits could be nothing, it could could be anything but a good work by God's power. And so, because the Pharisees accused Jesus of exercising demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, they were attributing to Satan the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is the supreme and unforgivable blasphemy. So Jesus once again confronted the Pharisees, uh, confronted the legalistic Pharisees and the self-righteous hypocrites with their ungodly thinking. And he publicly exposes their stiff necks and hard hearts. A tree and its fruit correspond. A tree is recognised by its fruit. So Jesus begins his warning with a parable. And now he goes on to sort of personalise it. And he changes the metaphor. He applies the parable of the good and bad trees directly to the Pharisees, saying, in effect, you are exceedingly worse than a number of bad trees. You are like a brood of vipers. Now, I have never been called a brood of vipers, and I've never heard anyone else called that name. But 
But Jesus calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers in the there and then was a serious, like an extremely serious denouncement and criticism that everyone understood. Uh, You may remember that John the Baptist used the term, employed the term, referring to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came to him for baptism. And Jesus also used it, employed it in his series of woes against them. Vipers was a general reference for a variety of poisonous snakes common to Palestine and the the Mediterranean area. And vipers, like a number of snakes, were not only deadly, but they're also deceptive. They, They sort of blend into their surroundings and often attack their victims with total surprise. The female viper would usually lay a large number of eggs and when they, uh, would, when they were hatched uh, and were old enough, they would disperse, they would leave the nest. So the comparison with the Pharisees is clear. Like a brood of vipers, the Pharisees travelled from place to place, usually in groups, at teaching and promoting their man-made traditions. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites, Jesus would later say to them. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert and when he becomes one of you, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. So their unbiblical legalistic traditions poison the minds of fellow Jews against the life-giving truth of God's word. And Jesus concludes personalising by saying in verse 24, how can you who are evil say anything good? In Shakespeare's play Othello, when the wealthy senator of Venice, uh, Venice's daughter, uh, had secretly married a Moor, uh, that is a man of African descent, he was incensed, he was outraged. But realising that he was powerless to undo what had been done, the senator listened to the advice of the duke, who said, the rod that smiles steals something from the thief. But the senator's daughter said that her allegiance was now to her husband rather than her father. And clearly upset, the senator replied, he said these words, words are words I never yet did hear that the bruised heart was pierced through the ear. Now one can understand the senator uh, was upset because of what his daughter had said to him. But can we agree that words are words in a sense that they they are merely sounds that come out of our mouths. Are words just words that come simply out of our mouths? Some years back, uh, I and the family uh, were holidaying at Scott's Head uh, Caravan Park, which is a Christian facility, uh, camping facility owned and operated. And as I was walking to the amenities, I came across a group of young Christians standing in a circle, praying in a very enthusiastic, sort of energetic way. And I thought to myself, this is, this is wonderful. This is, this is absolutely wonderful. Later on that same day, I was in the shower block and some of the members of the same prayer group were present. I can remember their faces. And friends, the subject matter of the, their conversations, I would not like to repeat I thought to myself, this is awful. (laughs) I went from this is wonderful to this is awful. Are words just noises that come out of our mouths? Sounds that have their origin in our mouths? Well, Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 34. He said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Friends, words according to Jesus are not just noises or sounds that come out of our mouths. Words exit the mouth, but according to Jesus, they come from our hearts. They are expressed through the mouth, but their origin is the heart. So the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Someone has been recorded as saying, what fills your heart will wag your tongue. Now, there's no question that God is concerned about what you think because what you think will determine the way you behave. That's why Paul recorded in Romans 12, 2, 
Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able, sorry, then you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. In Philippians, just for further endorsement, in Philippians 4, 8, we record, it records there, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You see, occupy your thoughts with such things. Now, the Greek word translated heart is cardia, from which we derive the English word cardiac. And while we often relate the word heart to our emotions, you know, for example, you, you can have a broken heart, you can have a sweet heart, you can have a hard heart, a soft heart. The Bible relates it primarily to the intellect or your thinking. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. That's why Proverbs instructs us to watch over our hearts with all diligence. In a secondary way, the heart relates to the will and the, and the emotions because they are determined by your intellect, your thinking. So the heart relates primarily to your mind, your, your, your intellect, your thinking. Therefore, when Jesus says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, he is saying words reveal most clearly the condition of your mind. The state of your mind, the condition of your mo mind is revealed or exposed through your mouth. And according to verse 35, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Question without notice. If you were carrying a bucket of water and someone bumped into you, what would spill out of the bucket? Water, of course. Yeah, it's not rocket science, right? If you were carrying a bucket of acid and someone bumped into you, what would spill out of the bucket? Acid, of course. So the only thing can spill out of your bucket is what you're carrying in it. Now, this is also true of a person's heart, friends. The only thing that can spill out of your mouth is what you're carrying in your heart. You see? The spilling may be somebody else's fault, but the content is yours. What comes out of your mouth is yours. So if you want to know what's in a person's heart, listen to them talk. Listen to their conversations. Listen to their words. The person whose heart is filled with lustful thoughts will eventually ventilate those thoughts in crude and suggestive remarks and comments. The person whose heart is filled with jealousy or resentment will in time express those thoughts verbally. In the same way, the person who is genuinely loving, kind and considerate cannot help expressing those thoughts in words and, of course, action. You see, the mouth is the ultimate expression and therefore an accurate revealer of your heart. And this is, true, this is true to such an extent, to such a degree, that Jesus went on to say in Matthew 12, 37, by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you'll be condemned. So it's by your words, sorry, it's, so it's your words that reveal whether you will be acquitted or condemned. But one of the many things that happens uh, when a person becomes a Christian is that the Lord changes the things they talk about. On occasion over the years, people have confessed to me, you know, since I became a believer in Jesus, since I became a Christian person, I don't swear anymore. It's amazingly, I talk different. I don't badmouth uh, people anymore. I don't ridicule people anymore. I don't run them down anymore. And that's simply because, friends, that's simply because if you have a renewed heart, you're going to have a renewed mouth. If you have a cleansed heart, you will have a cleansed mouth. See, being a disciple, being a Christian, being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ should have a profound effect on your mouth and, of course, your behaviour and conduct.
and the way you live. The late Dr. Edmund Orr uh, did his PhD thesis on revival history and he recorded the statistics uh, for the Welsh revival in 1904-05. You know, such was the impact, such was the impress of the gospel of Jesus Christ on Wales or in Wales that coal production decreased by 50%. 50%. Now, you're probably wondering, you might be thinking, what has coal production got to do with masses and masses of people coming to the foot of the cross, repenting of their sin and trusting in Jesus, coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour? Well, when the coal miners came under the sound of the gospel and were converted, they went back into the mines as Christian men. And the coal ponies who were so used to hearing the men give instructions by them swearing and cursing and blaspheming would no longer work because the men as Christian men would no longer swear and use such coarse, vulgar, harsh language. So coal production decreased in that country by 50% until, of course, the coal coal ponies uh, understood the language of Christian men. You see, if you have a renewed heart, you're going to have a renewed mouth. If you have a cleansed heart, you're going to have a cleansed mouth. And so we read these words in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And you'll notice how being filled with the Spirit manifests itself. Verse 19, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. You see, one of the most obvious outworkings of being filled with the Holy Spirit is found in your speaking, in your conversation, what you talk about. Your words and your conversations will reveal if you are influenced by or controlled by the Spirit of God. And the impossible, the impossible and, and opposite application of Ephesians 5 would be this. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with slurs, slander and swear words, criticisms and coarse language and so on. You see, that would be the impossible and opposite outworking or application of Ephesians 5. You know, as a non-Christian, I played uh, rugby league for about uh, 15 or 16 seasons, I can't remember. And I used to verbally uh, abuse and belittle the opposition. To me, that was all part of the psychological aspect of of the game. I can remember clearly running down the hard yards and an opposing player coming away injured and try, after trying to tackle me. And as he hobbled off, I said to him, get used to it. There's plenty more where that came from. Now, needless to say, as a Christian man, I have no desire to speak like that to anyone again. That's appalling. You know, there's an ancient story told about a wise Greek philosopher whose name was Bios. And one day he was given an animal to sacrifice And he was instructed to send back the best and the worst part of the animal. The wise man, Bios, sent back the tongue, you see, for he believed the tongue to be the best and the worst part of the animal. And this is endorsed uh, in Proverbs 18.21. The tongue has the power of life and death. So that the tongue has the potential to be constructive or destructive. The tongue has the potential to be helpful or unhelpful, productive, unproductive. Your tongue can enrich people or it can impoverish them. Your tongue can build, it can build up or it can tear down. Your tongue can bless and it can curse. And because of this potential to do both, the Christian can be guilty of destructive and counterproductive and unhelpful and impoverishing words. But the question at this point is this, are such words an habitual pattern in your life? Are death words 
a consistent theme in your behaviour? Are they reoccurring? Because the Bible evaluates a person's spiritual state not by their occasional sins, but by their reoccurring ones. Are they continually saying the wrong things? Are they continually using destructive, unhelpful, counterproductive, impoverishing words and are not progressing on to godliness and holiness and purity of speech? When I was a pastor of Curry Congregational Church, I would periodically find empty bottles of alcohol along um, the council strip uh, beside the church building often on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Now, their bottles were empty of their contents, but there was always a smell or an odour that remained. Now, friends, that's not unlike a Christian. If you're a Christian, then you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old contents are gone, the new has come. The new has come. You're a new creation. But there's an odour. There's still an odour or a smell that remains. But if you pour water, if you pour water into that bottle, fresh water, and then pour it out again, and you continually repeat the process, eventually that smell will fade. So when you become a believer, when you become a Christian, the old is poured out, but the smell remains. As you are continually filled with the Spirit of God, cleansing will take place. And that will affect, among a number number of other things, your mouth. And the more cleansing there is, the less likely you are to say the wrong things. That is, to be destructive in your conversation, unhelpful, unkind, unedifying. So conceited, we'll put our hands up. Christians do occasionally say the wrong things, but is it, an habitual pattern in your life? Is it a consistent theme in your speaking, in your conversations, in your engagement with others? You know, an old expression in the computer industry, me being a computer guy and all, is G-I-G-O, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. In other words, the quality of data entered determines the quality of results produced by that data. Now, in the same way, the quality of what is in a person's heart determines the quality of speech that person's mouth produces. So let me ask you, what is the quality of your heart? What is the condition of your mind? Are you watching over your mind with all diligence? Are you exercising discernment about what's going into your mind and therefore coming out your mouths? Uh, Are you parents exercising supervision? Are you supervising your children with what they're watching, listening to on the TV or on the computer screen? You know, Roman soldiers would often engage the enemy in hand-to-hand combat. And at such times, their weapon of choice was was the short sword with which they tried to penetrate their opponent's or their enemy's vital organs. And for his own protection, the Roman soldier wore a moulded metal breastplate that extended from the base of his neck to the top of his thighs. And it helped deflect any attack aimed at the soldier's heart an abdomen. Therefore, you can understand what Paul was saying, what Paul was meaning when he wrote to the believers in Ephesus in in chapter 6, verse 14. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So Paul was saying to the believers here, guard your hearts, protect your minds, defend your thinking, put your psychological armour on and keep it on. I submit during, during spiritual warfare, Satan primarily attacks your mind, your thinking. He targets your intellect and consequently your will and your emotions. If Satan can condition you to think in a way contrary to God's will or God's word, 
then he's won a significant victory. That is why he attempts to engage your mind with lies and distortions and perversions of truth. He tries to blur the line between what is righteous and what is unrighteous. He clothes sin in the garment of worldly entertainment. He camouflages it in ungodly music. He hides it in certain forms of humour. Therefore, we need to be diligent students of God's word, coming coming to it with a humble and a contrite heart, renewing our minds day by day so that we can test and approve what God's will is. And this concisely reiterates the words of the psalmist. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young woman keep her way pure? How can a young person, old person, doesn't matter, principles the same, keep their way pure? By living according to your word which we must must treasure in our hearts, see, our minds. If you neglect the study of God's word, you make yourself vulnerable to Satan's attacks, who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for, for, for people to devour. And the evidence for this is obvious for all who have eyes to see. As many countries are decaying from within, right before our very eyes. So what is the state of your heart? What is the state of your heart? What is the condition of your mind? When you consider that question, friends, when you consider that question, you really don't need to answer it, do you? You don't need to answer it. Because words reveal most clearly the condition of your heart. Words reveal most clearly the state of your mind. You know, over the 25 years I have been a pastor, I've struggled to know what is the best thing for me to do on my day off. I've tried a number of things without success. I know what the worst thing for me to do is, and that's nothing, just do nothing. No. But during the rugby league season, I go down and watch Curry first grade uh, play. And I sit in the old wooden stand uh, with my big winter jacket on, obviously to keep warm, and I sit, sit there with the rest of the crowd. Words reveal most clearly the condition of people's hearts. And let me, be, let, let me be very clear. Let me make this impress. We cannot clean our own hearts, okay? You'll be more productive trying to chase the wind or trying to go down to the beach and hold back the tide. For Jesus Christ died an horrific death on this brutal, barbaric Roman cross in order to do that for us. But on the third day, he victoriously and he gloriously rose from the dead. And this day he calls, but he also commands everybody everywhere to turn to him, to turn away from sin and self-will and living to please yourself and personally exercise trust in him. For when we do that, when we turn away from sin and rebellion and disobedience to the authority of God, and personally exercise trust in his son, King Jesus. He cleanses our hearts and consequently our mouths. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, what a fantastic talk from Neville that was. One thing that I've been challenged by lately is the idea of rest. Reading through the Gospel of Mark, I've realised how often Jesus goes and rests from the work of preaching and healing the sick, just to spend time with God, not to have a day off to kick back and binge 12 hours of a TV show, but to really spend time intentionally with God. I'm starting to put that into practice more in my life, um, and I pray that you will make time to do that as well this week, uh, to spend time to reflect, maybe open up this passage again in a couple of days and look back at Jesus' words and think back on what Neville's brought to us as well. Let's spend some time in prayer now. If you'd like to bow your heads with me.
Father God, we thank you that you do not tolerate religious and moral corruption, that you are a just God who stands up against it. Father, we pray that we might be your disciples in that and that you would give us boldness when we too need to stand up and call out what's not right in the world. Uh, Help us to always, though, follow your word, not following our own opinions or necessarily the the culture we've been brought up in, but always check uh, against your word and use that to be our guide. Father, we pray for all the people in our congregation who are sick and recovering from surgery and radiation at the moment. Lord, we lift them up to you. Lord, we lift to you the people who are grieving for the loss of loved ones at the moment. We pray that you would be with them and let them know your presence and your goodness. Father, I pray that you would uh, be with our leaders uh, this week as they make some tough decisions about COVID and the restrictions. We pray that you would give them wisdom and insight and listening ears. Um, And Father God, we just pray that you would help us to be spending time with you intentionally. Help us to carve out that rest time like Jesus did uh, to make sure that we are spending time with you in rest and in worship. Lord, finally, we pray that you would make us good trees, good trees that bear good fruit. And Father, help us to see that in our lives. Give us the encouragement that we are indeed saved, that we are your disciples, not through our own works, but because of putting our faith in what you've done for us. You've done all the heavy lifting. But Lord, help us to see that we are becoming more and more like you each day, each week, each month. Help us to see that there is good fruit that you are bearing in our lives so that we might not be discouraged but might rather be encouraged to keep going, uh, sharing your word, doing acts of love for those in our lives and our community, and more and more as we see the day approaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for coming to join with us today. Uh, We'll be back on this time next week. In two weeks, we'll be starting a special series called Life Program. Um, This will run for five weeks. This is a program that is designed to be evangelistic. It's designed for us to bring our friends along who want to find out more. They want to engage with the gospel. They want to engage with the Christian message, ask really good questions and think critically about it uh, and hopefully get to know better God better through it. We're going to be running that uh, with church instead of normal church service to give all of us a taste of what this life course looks like uh, so that we might be encouraged to invite friends along next year uh, when we run it, hopefully in person. Uh, So make sure you dial in in two weeks to catch the start of the life course uh, so that we can taste it for ourselves. Thanks, and I'll see you next week.